Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. This is a beautiful day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And it is a delight to uh, welcome you to the worship of God here at Timber Ridge Presbyterian Church. I'm glad to be with you this morning, and I'm um, glad that you're here uh, with me as well. There are some announcements in your bulletin, and I have a few more to add uh, to that. Uh, the one that's in your bulletin there uh, talks about the Compassion Fellowship Committee and their meeting on Tuesday. Um, can it really be no November 19th already? Oh, my goodness. Wow. Um, but some others. Uh, next week, um, we have a scheduled communion for next week. So Bill Klein will be here to... Uh, preach and administer uh, the sacrament of communion. Uh, what your job is, is to prepare your hearts and minds for that. Um, that's especially important with the sacraments, that you think about it ahead of time, not just when you walk in the church, you know, that particular day. And then on December the 1st, that's our Christmas program. Uh, we get that. Uh, going in. Also, that's the first Sunday of Advent. Uh, so we'll, um, you know, be transitioning into that with the program and then with further Advent celebration after that. Um, the session um, meets on Tuesday. Um, so that's coming up this week as well. And uh, we have an announcement about the shoebox. Where's the shoebox? There's the shoebox lead. Shoebox lead. This week, of course, tomorrow, kickoff shoebox collection um, will be at the community building every day until the following Monday. Monday morning, we'll leave with shoeboxes delivered to the uh, church at Garrisonburg. If you, there are sign up sheets in the front and in the back Sunday school building. If you'd like to sign up to help, <clears throat> And we will collect our shoe boxes here next Sunday to be dedicated and shipped out. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Um, also, um, Sally Muse is in the hospital in here in Lexington. So our prayers are needed for that, that ministry as well. And I want to uh, thank you personally for uh, the prayers and concern that you uh, showed for Sharon, my wife. She had a uh, bicycle accident two weeks ago. Um, we managed to uh, calm her down for about one week, but she just can't take staying at home. Uh, but uh, she did take a week off, and then um, she has gone back to her uh, computer business. Uh, she does home computer, work with people, and work at home as well. Uh, and she went back to a modified schedule this past week. Uh, we did persuade her that uh, when she felt tired to take a nap and rest and not just, she's a hard charger, believe me. Uh, but anyway, we appreciate um, so much the concern that, that you showed for our, our family. Well, our prelude uh, this morning is a wonderful um, piece and um, part of a hymn, uh, Jesu, Joy of Man's Desire.
if you attend to the bulletin, our call to worship, it's taken, of course, from a famous passage of scripture from uh, Micah the prophet, and it's a responsive kind of, of reading. So I'll begin. With what shall we come before the Lord, the Holy One? How shall we bow before the Lord God Almighty? What indeed does God require of us? Amen and amen. And our hymn is number 33. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting hymn, I think, uh, and one that really makes you think. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. <clears throat> Uh, our Bible lesson this morning uh, focuses on um, Moses, and um, I just want to remind you in this part of our service, I want to remind you of some of the things that you know go on with Moses and and what have you, uh, so that we'll be prepared then uh, to think about our own preparation and how we fit into that when the time comes a little later on in service. So as we uh, we focus on uh, Moses, what we, one thing we find out is that uh, Moses has uh, three parts to his life uh, that you can easily divide his life into. The first part is uh, the Egyptian part. Um, he was born in Egypt, and at that time, the Pharaoh uh, was worried that the Israelites were becoming too strong, that they would uh, force a rebellion in Egypt. And so he ordered that all the male babies be killed. And in order to avoid that, um, Moses' mother and, and his sister, Miriam, um, they made plans to hide Moses, thinking that maybe they could spare his life that way or something would happen. So you all remember the story. They put him by the in the bulrushes by the river, by the Nile, 
and he was later found by the Egyptian princess, and he became part of Pharaoh's court. That lasted for about 40 years. It was a pretty good, pretty good time frame there. Then the next 40 years, though, were spent in the wilderness. Moses was in the wilderness. He had to flee Egypt because he wanted to do something for his people, but he didn't choose a very good pace for that, and he still got. You know, he. I hate to say it, I guess, but my experience has has proven to me that sometimes even when I want to do something good, I don't choose the right way to do it, and it doesn't turn out that way. So that that caused him to become a fleeing felon. Yeah, that's a term here today, a fleeing felon. And uh, he spent 40 years in the wilderness. Then God uh, called him back to his real work in the sense for his primary work of serving God in that uh, the time of redemption, the plan of redemption that we've been talking about. And God called him in the wilderness to go back to Egypt and to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Now, um, Max Lucado, some of you may be familiar with Max Lucado. He's a, he's a fairly famous um, writer he has a uh, pastor he has a church in san antonio texas but he's written a lot of devotional things and uh, here's what max lucado says he says moses had three periods in his lifetime he first spent 40 years as a somebody in egypt he, he was right there he was with pharaoh's court he was learning all those things he was a big guy in Egypt. The second 40 years of his life he spent as a nobody in the wilderness. He went out to the wilderness. He met some uh, some ladies, you know, trying to get water for their uh, animals. And he finally married one of those uh, women out in the wilderness. Then Lucato says he spent 40 years back in Egypt and traveling to the promised land, finding out how much God can do with a nobody. It's an interesting career if you if you think about it. And we will come back to that in a few minutes, but we're going to enjoy our our anthem today. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. 
standing and leaning at the same time. Amen. All right. Got to love it. Got to love it. Oh, my word. Thank you all. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, we have been through a tumultuous time in our country with the election and a lot of things that were going on leading up to the election. Um, a lot of other uh, kinds of things that, that disturb us. Some of us have personal things with illness, with my wife's bike wreck, that was personal to us. We have a lady that's in a hospital, Lord, and all our lives, it, it, they just don't go smoothly. We're thinking about Moses today. His life didn't go smoothly by any means. But the choir has reminded us, joyfully reminded us, that the thing that we can always count on is that God has called us, God is with us, that we are indeed standing on the promises and we are leaning in by the presence of the Holy Spirit to communion with God so that those things which upset us, those things which even knock us down, but God helps us to get up. God always helps us to get up and to realize that he is still in control, that he is taking care of things. I remember that uh, verse from Proverbs, Lord, that even when there are many things going through our minds, that it is the promises of God that will be established. Yes, as men and women, we do think about many things and sometimes we're confused and sometimes we're fearful and sometimes we don't know what to think. But God's plan for our lives is what counts. And Lord, this church and these folks here, these good folks are trying to figure out exactly what the future holds for them as individuals and as a congregation. And we pray most earnestly, Lord, that you would help them to make that clear, that you would clear away the mist that sometimes surrounds us and keeps us from seeing how you are working in our lives and in the life of our churches. Lord, clear away that mist so that we can, we can see clearly and feel the sense of leading from the Holy Spirit. We do pray for those who have sickness and other kinds of difficulty in their lives. We pray that you would let your Holy Spirit minister to them. Lord, that you would heal them, that you would bring them home from the hospital or from some other kind of uh, recuperation. Lord, we appreciate the ministry that you are doing through this congregation with programs like the shoe boxes and other helping programs that come from this this church and the faithful people here. Well, we appreciate that very, very much. We also are thankful, Lord, that you taught your disciples how to pray. Because a lot of times we don't exactly know how to pray and we, we fear that we're not reaching you or, or you're not reaching us somehow. But Lord, we always know that when we pray the prayer that you taught us, that is effective. So now we pray before you, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of Amen. And may God's peace rest upon you on the choir. And I, well, you can have some time to pass that peace on to others and say good morning to me. Glory be to the Father. Amen. You can go ahead and sit down. Yeah. I'm going to come down and see you in a minute. Yeah. Now you have, we have a little bit different order of worship today, so now's the time uh, to, to bring your tithes and your offerings to the Lord. So let your heart open up to the ministry that God has through you and, and for you as you give your tithes and your offerings to the Lord. Lord, as we prepare to enter into the season of Advent and Christmas, we think of the gracious gift that you offered to us through your son, Jesus. Lord, may our hearts be as open as his was toward us. May we have that same open heart toward other people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. How are we doing today? 
Okay, okay. Okay, so we're supposed to talk about preparation and practice today. So, in your minds, what, what's the difference between preparation and practice? Uh, sounds good to me. Did all you be hear that? You might want to take this down. Uh, preparation is before you do it, and practice is while you're doing it. Okay, makes sense to me. So uh, let's let's think about something specific. You are so good at this. Um, what are some things you would do to prepare for Thanksgiving? It's coming up, right? What what would you do? Some, is somebody going to cook a turkey or ham, maybe? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe some people have spaghetti and meatballs for Thanksgiving, but whatever. Okay, so that would be preparation, right? You have to get that ready. I, I, I wasn't thinking of telling you this, but, uh, you know, my... My mother and my wife played a dirty trick on me one time for Thanksgiving because my mom and my wife used to uh, fix a cherry salad for Thanksgiving and it was wonder it was wonderful but um, they also fixed some red beets for Thanksgiving dinner. You all know red beets? I don't know, they're not, they're not too popular. They're never popular with me. <laughs> anyway, so we sat down and I even praised my mom. Oh, mom, I'm so glad that you fixed that, those, uh, that cherry salad from, you know, it's so delicious, etc. And nobody said a word. And I took a big helping of what I thought was that uh, cherry salad. And then I took a bite of it, and it was red beets. Uh, I couldn't believe, do you, do you believe that my wife and my mother played that trick on me? Wow. They prepared, but that, uh, that didn't go so well. In fact, I, I preached a sermon later on um, on a Thanksgiving uh, occasion out in Bath County, and the title of my sermon was Why I Hate Red Beets. <laughs> anyway, well, we're going to think about what you have to do for, to prepare something, and then practice, right, is when, like, oh, you do it once and well, maybe it doesn't turn out so well and then you do it again and you keep practicing like running, you know, uh, you know, hitting a baseball, playing volleyball, uh, even, you know, babies even have to practice walking, right? You can't remember when you were a baby, but, but you have to learn to walk. And, you know, those first few steps, now they have to, you have to record that on your phone, right? If the baby walks, you have to get that recorded on your phone. So we're going to be talking some more about that, and I'm talking to the church today and to the individual members about uh, preparation and practicing, okay? So thank you for getting us started. I appreciate that. And you're going to go and prepare... You're, you're in the preparation stage for the musical, right? Okay, so have fun preparing. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. 
Lord Jesus, help us to open our minds and our hearts to what you're doing here uh, with us, in us, Lord. Help us to understand the experiences that you're giving us that we can use as the preparation that you have intended for us and sometimes also the practice of that in the right way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Folks, you, you realize that uh, for the past five or six weeks, we've been on the same theme, but we've been coming at it from a little different angle each time so that, you know, it wasn't just completely boring. And, uh, you know, the, the idea is a simple idea, and it's illustrated over and over and over and over again in the scriptures. That we are, as individuals, and also as a church, we are getting training from God and leading from God to take our place in God's great drama of redemption. Now, I know that sounds kind of bigger than we all are, and it sounds like, who am I? I mean, I'm presumptuous to think. No, that's the way God works. Sometimes it's small things that people did in the scriptures. Sometimes it's small things that we do. Sometimes it's big things in the scripture that people do. Like Moses is a giant figure. He's a giant figure. Last week we had Esther as practically the only one who could have that role where she bravely walked into the king of Persia when she wasn't supposed to and she didn't get killed. He said, come on in, dear. Come on in. And then she saved the people of Israel. She saved the Jews from annihilation. Moses spent a whole lifetime in preparation and then in the work that God had set aside for him to do in the great drama of redemption. He is a gigantic figure in the Old Testament. It's, it's amazing. So, you know, the, the kind of thing that we need to do to translate that is to see where we fit in. And, you know, I know that we probably can't get things maybe exact or, or maybe we're not listening for the right way or in the right way for the Lord to speak to us, but we can get it. We can get what the Lord has for us to do as individuals and as a congregation of God's people. You know, Moses, first part of Moses' life, it was a miracle. The boy babies were being killed because Pharaoh was concerned that he was being overrun by Israelite babies and he feared that his his reign and his kingdom in Egypt was going to be taken over there's just too many Israelites now his mother and this is if, if feel free to use this a good trivia question is what was the name of Moses mother because all it says in the beginning of Exodus is his mother. Okay. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You got to look it up. Okay. But it's an interesting trivia question. But she was taking care of her little baby. And she said, I got to do something because they're killing the boys. So she devises this scheme. You know, Moses is unaware of things at this point right it's just a baby if you know a few weeks old she puts him in the basket down by the Nile she she appoints Mary, Miriam my wife's middle name by the way is Miriam so I got an affection for that Miriam she looks after the 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 
little, little boy Moses, a little baby. And um, when she sees that the Egyptian princes have come down to take him out of the water, she she hurries up and says, oh, do you need somebody to nurse him? You know, no going to the store and getting the formula, et cetera, et cetera, right? No, no, this is this is the older days, okay? And who does she get? You remember? His own mother. His own mother comes to nurse him and takes care of him until he doesn't need to be nursed anymore or else uh, the princess says, oh, well, I can handle it now or whatever happens. But that is the beginning of the plan that God had for Moses to be an important figure in the drama of redemption. Now, I pointed out to you folks in the last few weeks that families are a good place to start figuring out what you're supposed to be doing in the drama. Because God does a lot of things through families. You know, it, you, you just have to kind of pay attention. You know, and I know um, from looking out at the crowd that most of you aren't ready for another baby right now, okay? But you got children who have grandchildren, and maybe some of you have grandchildren that have children. You still got them coming along, and you can make a significant difference in their lives. You know, I, I, uh, I appreciate my parents so much, and I've mentioned them quite a few times, and, but I have so much to owe to them. You know, my love of the Bible primarily comes from my mother who read her Bible nearly every day and never did force me to read my Bible, but because she was reading the Bible, I thought, well, it might be a good thing for me to do. And I started that probably when I was 10 or 12 years old and at least reading some and then, you know, reading through the Bible. But, you know, there are all sorts of ways that God might be speaking to you. You know, throughout the years, I've had one or two verses where God just sort of slapped me in the face with a scripture lesson. You know, one of those uh, one of those times uh, was I was just reading uh, in the book of Acts uh, about the martyrdom of uh, Stephen in the book, first few chapters of Acts. And there's an in interesting and just a powerful verse. It says that godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. You know, I, that shocked me in a way. And I, you know, I was a pastor by this time, okay? So I was preaching a lot of funerals, right? So that God spoke to me and said, if you want a good funeral, this is what you need. You need to have an, a life where godly men can mourn for you. You can't just wait until you die and then think, come on, I want to enjoy this now. No, you've got to build that. Same thing with other things that you can learn from, from your family. Okay, what about 40 years in the wilderness? We don't have time for any more family illustrations. 40 years in the wilderness. You know, one one thing that people have asked me over and over again um, because of my background, I didn't spend 40 years in the wilderness, but I spent four years in college, okay? I spent three years in law school at UVA. I spent three years in the Navy. I spent three years at Union Seminary in Richmond before I came out to Bath County. One thing that people have asked me, you know, 
uh, they said, uh, well, did you did you ever feel like you were wasting your time? Why didn't you just become a preacher and that'd be it? I said, no, it wasn't time wasted. It was preparation. It was being prepared for all those things that were going to happen out there in backhand. I, you, you think backhand is just a sleepy guy. A lot of stuff going on out there. Okay. But it was just preparation. And, yeah, you know, that's, that's how Timber Ridge Church and the members of Timber Ridge Church need to think about what God is doing with you now. What are you preparing for? What is God preparing you for? What role will you have as a church and as individuals in God's great drama of redemption? You know, when I first went to Windy Cove, I didn't know how long I was going to be there. And several times I thought, um, well, you know, I don't know, maybe be time to move on or something like that. But every time I thought that, the Lord said, no, no, it's not. It's not time. You're right. You're right where you're supposed to be. That's the place that we fit in. That's the place that we become part of this redemptive history as individuals or as a church. You know, it's just looking back in the in the hallway. It's interesting when the choir's practicing, you know, and I don't want to get in their way. So I look at the pictures back in the hallway. And I was looking at one taken here at uh, Timber Ridge, a special anniversary. Uh, you know, it was in 1971. It was 225 years, I think it was. Okay. Wow. Was that a big celebration? I couldn't even count the people in the picture. It was a wonderful thing to that. That may be what God is calling you today for something like that. I know it's hard to look around. I know it's hard to look around and see only five or 10 or 15 or 20, but you never know. You know, I was talking to a pastor recently. Uh, pastor friend of mine here in town, and he had just been to a conference, and we were talking about, you know, churches have a cycle. It, it's like the sine curve. It goes up and down, okay? And yeah, you may be at a lower point right now, but that doesn't mean it's always going to be like that. Or you might even be at a personal low yourself. But God may have good plans for you, big plans for you as an individual and as a church. That's the way God works things. Was Moses' time in the desert wasted? My goodness, folks. He had to spend 40 years in the desert shepherding a whole group of people getting them to the promised land and looking after them until they got to go into the promised land. The time that he spent the 40 years in the desert learning or preparing was time well spent, as is our time well spent in preparing for the job that God has us to do. Now, did, did Moses... Did Moses always realize this? Did he always realize this ahead of time? You, you, if you want to read something funny, okay? If you want to read something funny in the scriptures, just read the passage where God calls Moses to go back to Egypt, okay? So you, you know the story, right? There's a burning bush, and the bush is burning, and Moses is out there shepherding the flock, and he sees this bush burning. But guess what? It was burning, but it was not consumed. 
usually when a house catches on fire, burns up, right? Usually the bush goes even quicker. But it didn't burn up. And here's what Moses said. Oh, he could have missed it so easily. Here's what he said. I think, I think that I would turn aside and see this sight, the bush that is burning, but not burned up. What an unusual sight. I go back home and report it to the wife or something. No. As he approached the bush, God called out to him. Boy, what if he hadn't decided to approach the bush? He would have missed his calling altogether. Unbelievable. Now, now he's at the bush, right? We, we don't have time for all of this, but, but it's okay. You can read it for yourself. He gives five excuses why he can't be the one. Okay? You know, and you know, you know some of them. You know, the most, maybe the most famous one is like, I'm not a very good speaker. You know, I can't really put things into words, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, it just won't work for me. And, you know, God said, okay, okay. And, and God does get sort of pain with Moses after a while. But at first he just said, well, how about your brother Aaron? We'll send him along with you. Give him, give you some support. But, but at the end, you know, you know what Moses' last excuse is. He's run out of excuses, but this is human nature. Moses says, to, Moses says, Moses says to God, send somebody else. And you know what God said? I, I can just picture it in my mind. You're the man. That's what he said. You're the man. Let's go. No more excuse. He couldn't make it any plainer. He couldn't make it any plainer. That burning bush led to 40 years back in Egypt and in the wilderness. I can't tell you exactly what the next 40 years of your life is going to be or the next 40 years of the life of Timber Ridge. I hope I'm around to see it. I told him out in Bath that if I lived to be 100 years old, I'd come back and preach homecoming because it would be their 300th anniversary. Some days I'm, I'm weary and I don't think I'm going to make it. But other days, maybe, maybe I can. But I don't know what's going to come. But listen, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you as individuals and as a church. Just hear the whisper. Hear the whisper. Come and look at the bush that doesn't burn up. See the signs in the scriptures that apply to you. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. And there's a lot of other scriptures beyond that that apply to you. Listen. Listen to what God has in store for you. Become another Esther or Moses or a bunch of other people in that Bible that we can mention. Let us pray. Lord, we do indeed thank you for the way you continue to uh, speak to us. Uh, Lord, you have so much more in store for this congregation and for these individual worshipers. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would whisper in their ears. We put that burning bush in their paths and have them turn aside and hear the voice of God speaking to them. In Jesus' name, amen.
And our uh, hymn of response today, the wonderful hymn, Oh Jesus, I Have Promised, number 676. Friends, that's your charge for today, to have the grace to listen and to follow. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of God's Holy Spirit rest upon you now and forevermore. Amen.